Hello everybody, welcome to another Yellow Chair Devotional. We've been looking at all of the books of the Bible together, one book each day, and we've seen that even though there's 66 different books in our Bible, they make up one big story, God's love story for you and me. So we've been in the New Testament, let's review quick. We started out with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the Gospels, what did the word gospel mean? good news the good news about jesus because this is where the life death resurrection of jesus takes place and jesus oh jesus changes everything and there was the birth of the christian church and we saw that the book of acts is our church history book and it traces the new christian church as the good news about jesus the gospel spreads everywhere. The Holy Spirit comes down, dwells in people's hearts, and starts mixing things up, shaking things up, saying good news, good news about Jesus. And so now that the good news of Jesus is spreading, it takes apostles like Paul to encourage these churches, encourage the people. So then we saw the Pauline epistles, or the letters written by Paul. We went to Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And in all of those, we saw where Paul was encouraging and giving instruction and being led by the Spirit to say, hey, this is something you're going through. What about this? Or remember, it's all about Jesus. It's not about the insiders, the outsiders. It's not about the Jews or the Gentiles. And so he's giving all of this amazing wisdom to God's people. Then we moved into our latest category, which is the general epistles. The general epistles just means letters written by a bunch of different authors. We looked at Hebrews. Then we looked at James. James was written by the brother of Jesus. And today we're looking at the book of First Peter. So First Peter is written by Peter. And who was Peter? Oh, Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, right? He was one of Jesus' good friends. Peter was known for oh, having a temper or getting really animated and worked up and excited about things. But what else did Peter do? Well, he walked on water. Did he deny Jesus and the rooster crowed? Yeah. But then did Jesus forgive him and say, Peter, I'm going to use you to do great things in the lives of this new Christian church? Absolutely. So grab your Bible. Let's find the book of 1 Peter together. If we start in the back of our Bibles at Revelation, we only have to flip a few pages and you'll hit 1 Peter because a lot of these general epistles, these last few books are pretty short. And here in the book of 1 Peter, this letter this is a letter that Peter specifically is writing to Christians who are suffering. They are discouraged. They're going through persecution, right? We've talked about how it was not easy to be a Christian. It still isn't. But back then, especially, it was a new religion. It was not looked on favorably. People were being thrown in prison. Think about how many disciples were thrown in prison, writing letters like Paul from jail. They were being killed. Oh, so many things were happening. Spies seeking out Christians. Just a lot of hardship and suffering. And Peter is writing to encourage them. And so in the very beginning here, in the first couple of verses here of 1 Peter, this is what he says. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's chosen people who are away from their homes. You are scattered all around the countries of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God planned long ago to choose you by making you his holy people. Making you holy is the Spirit's work. God wanted you to obey him and to be made clean by the blood of the death of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be yours more and more. And so here we see some, some really good news where it says, God planned long ago to choose you by making you his holy people. Think about that. From the very beginning of our Bibles in the book of Genesis, God has had a plan. And his plan always is to choose us. He is a relational God. He wants to be our friends. He wants to be close to us. He chooses us. 
And in the Old Testament, we saw that he chose the people of Israel, right? The Israelite nation to be his holy people so that they might be a blessing to everyone else. And now we're seeing that blessing come to pass. We are seeing that now it's not about just the Israelites. It's about everybody. And the good news at Pentecost with the Holy Spirit, remember, it's getting spread to all of the world. Jesus goes, it's for everybody. We are all part of the family of God. And we've seen that plan from the very beginning. God has always wanted all of us. He chooses you. And then he just asks us, will you choose me? back. Will you choose me back? And so these nations, these people groups that he listed here, the countries of Pontus, Galatia, they are what was part of Asia at the time. It's like modern day, the country of Turkey. But he's reaching to the outsiders, right? They're scattered, but they are still chosen by God. Let's keep reading in verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has great mercy, and because of his mercy, he gave us a new life. He gave us a living hope because Jesus Christ rose from death. Now we hope for the blessings God has for his children. These blessings are kept for you in heaven. They cannot be destroyed or be spoiled or lose their beauty. God's power protects you through your faith and it keeps you safe until your salvation comes. That salvation is ready to be given to you at the end of time. This makes you very happy. But now for a short time, different kinds of troubles may make you sad. These troubles come to prove that your faith is pure. This purity of faith is worth more than gold. Gold can be proved to be pure by fire, but gold will ruin. But the purity of your faith will, uh, will bring you praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ comes again. You have not seen Christ, but still you love him. You cannot see him now, but you believe in him. You are filled with joy that cannot be explained, and that joy is full of glory. Your faith has a goal to save your souls, and you are receiving that goal, your salvation. And so what Peter is saying here, what Peter is saying is that the suffering, the hard times that we go through, does it take away our salvation? Does it mean that we aren't saved? Does it mean that we're not good enough Christians yet? No, no. He's saying, what Peter is saying is, you haven't seen Christ, right? Peter, Peter walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, was friends with Jesus. We haven't seen Jesus, but we love him. We believe in him and we're filled with joy. And that saves our souls. When we believe we're saved because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we are saved no matter what. Peter goes, you guys are safe. You're taken care of. You are good. But the hard times you're going through right now, it's those attacks of the enemy. Those attacks of the enemy because there's nothing the enemy likes less than us having a friendship with Jesus. Than us being a believer, a Christian and the enemy attacks, attacks. The enemy knows I've been defeated at the cross. I am kaput. I'm toast. But until Jesus comes again and finishes the work, the enemy attacks and attacks. And so that's what uh, Peter is saying here, where, where he explains like the troubles come like, like gold, right? When I melt, if I melted gold in fire, if there was any dirt, if there was any junk in the gold, that would like separate, right? And that's what he's saying here. We're going to go through some heat. We're going to go through some heat in life where the enemy is attacking us. But that strengthens our faith because we fix our eyes on Jesus. Think about how Paul talked about those races we run, right? We don't stop running our race. We know it's going to be hard sometimes, but we don't blame God for it. We put the blame where the blame is due. We put it on the enemy. The enemy has done this. And we hang on to the fact that we have our faith. We believe in Jesus and we have received that goal, which is our salvation. So then let's pop over to chapter two, because then we see first, uh, we see Peter use an illustration. So then this is chapter two, verse one. So then get rid of all evil and all lying. Do not be a hypocrite. Do not be jealous or speak evil of others. Put all of these things out of your life. As newborn babies want milk, you should want the pure and simple teaching. By it you can grow and be saved. For you already examined and seen how good the Lord is. 
The Lord is the stone that lives. The people of the world did not want this stone, but he was the stone God chose. To God, he was worth much. So come to him. You also are like living stones. Let yourselves be used to build a spiritual temple, to be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. He will accept those sacrifices through Jesus Christ. The scripture says, I will put a stone in the ground in Jerusalem. Everything will be built built on this important and precious rock. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. That's from Isaiah. This stone is worth much to you who believe, but the people who, be not, who do not believe, he is the stone that the builders did not want. It has become the cornerstone. And that's from Psalms. To the people who do not believe, he is a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Isaiah again. They stumble because they do not obey what God says. This is what God planned to happen to them. But you are a chosen people. You are the king's priests. You are a holy nation. You are a nation that belongs to God alone. God chose you to tell about the wonderful things he has done. He has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. In the past you had never received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. So what are we seeing here? What are we seeing? That Jesus is this stone. All right, I think about several things. I think about how when they were building the temple, right? They, they have this example of Jesus being the cornerstone and the stone that the builders rejected. And there is a Jewish legend, stories that can be proven in different books by different scholars like Josephus and others. When they were building the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon did not want any noise of construction happening in the city. So they they took and um, carved all the rocks. They got everything ready outside of the city. And then they brought all the pieces into the city and then put them together almost like Legos. You've built a Lego set. And so if you've built a Lego set, right, you had some sort of instructions of, well, this brick goes here and this brick goes here and this brick goes here. Well, so they're outside the city and they're carving all these stones and they're measuring them and then they're marking them, right? They would use like paint or something to mark the stones of how, where to put them. They lugged all of these, these big stones into the city to build the temple and they start putting them and the builders come across this one stone that's just a weird shape, this weird shape. And they go, I don't know where this stone goes. It doesn't, it's just, ah. And they rejected it. They said, this doesn't fit anywhere. Well, they keep building, they keep building. And all along, they're looking for the perfect cornerstone, the stone that takes a lot of weight. Imagine if you're balancing on a pillow, right? If the ground is uneven, do you kind of wobble, right? You wobble, you're trying to get your balance. Well, that's just like when you're building a building. There's got to be firm foundation rocks that can take the weight from the uneven ground because you're building the whole weight of the building on top of it and they were searching for a cornerstone that could take that weight well the none of the rocks that they have tried are working they'll put a rock in they'll keep building keep building and it'll crack under the pressure and finally one of the workers is looking at it and goes what about that odd shaped rock and they look and the stone that they had rejected, it had weathered all of the seasons. It was still whole, it was still good. They brought that rock back in and it was the perfect fit to be that cornerstone and it laid a firm foundation. And so here that compares to Jesus, our firm foundation. I'm also reminded of Daniel chapter two, when Nebuchadnezzar has that dream, right, of that image with all the, the body parts that are made out of the different metals, the different kingdoms. And what happens at the very end? A stone comes and destroys it. And it is the kingdom that rules forever. Jesus, Peter is saying, is the stone that lives there's people who didn't want that. There's people who choose not to follow Jesus. He goes, but, to, but God, oh, he's worth so much to him. Build yourself on Jesus. You also are living stones. 
be a spiritual temple for the Holy Spirit, to be holy priests, offer those sacrifices to God. And then at the end, it says, you're chosen people. You are the king's priest. You're a holy nation. God chose you to tell about the wonderful things he has done. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Jesus calls us to have him as our firm foundation. Him as our firm foundation. He is our cornerstone. And then when the enemy comes attacking, when that suffering comes, we are living stones built on the rock, built on Jesus. We have that firm foundation. We have been chosen by God for, and we can tell about the wonderful things that he has done. Let's pray together. Dear God, we're so thankful that you are our foundation. Jesus, our cornerstone. We know that we can weather whatever attacks the enemy sends our way as long as we put our trust in you. We keep believing and holding on to you. It'll all be okay. You have chosen us over and over and over again because you love us so much. Thank you for that love in your name. Amen. All right. There are discussion questions in the video description below. And then also a link to the song Cornerstone. Because we can't talk about Jesus being our cornerstone without also singing the song. What a beautiful song. And listen to the words in light of what we just read in 1 Peter. And then our takeaway verse. Our takeaway verse is 1 Peter 1. 3 to 4, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What good news! What good news! Because of Jesus, everything coming our way won't ever perish. It's not defiled. It will never fade. The enemy can attack and attack. And it's okay because we're built on the rock. We've got Jesus and it'll all be all right. I will see you tomorrow.